Oh, come in, come in. Oh, hello, nice to see you. Come and have a seat. Mm. Oh, yeah, it's a good idea. Close the door. Makes it a bit more cosy. I thought I'd um, be nice to look at a, a book we actually looked at together years ago. I mean, it was about three years ago, I think, when you came round. Um, I was still in the other house then. I had the study on the ground floor. I think I was just coming in from a walk. And um, I showed you, you may remember it, this very interesting book, very beautiful book, by Robert Gibbings. So, Sweet Thames Run Softly. And um, Robert Gibbings, as I think I... Look, I love the way this little motif of the duck, a very fine woodcut, um, is then motif re repeating gold. Anyway, Gibbings it was a very remarkable man. He was a fine writer, fine nature writer, a great adventurer and traveller but also a superb artist, and particularly he helped to revive the form of woodblock uh, carving. So you carve on the wooden block. I'm, I got very interested in that again, because the, if you look at these, the, the, there's a writer, Steve, um, illustrator Stephen Crotts, who I think is going to eventually be the person to illustrate my Arthuriad. Um, he's, you know, reviving this uh, skill with carving on a wooden block, incising and then using the block to print. So Gibbings did that and he founded the Golden, or he was one of the founders I think of the Golden Cockerel Press. So they did really high end, you know, super expensive books and editions of Chaucer and things like that. But he also made his art available and his writing to the wider public. This is published by Dent, who are a very popular publisher. And I, it probably costs even less now than it did then. But take a little look at this, just for context. You see, it's a beautiful book. It's about a floating down the River Thames in a canoe of his own making. Couldn't be more uh, idyllic. But then take a look. I'll get my glasses on. First published, 1940. Reprinted, 1940 twice. 1941 three times and you'll see this particular edition to Edith with best wishes uh, at Christmas 1942 and yet you'll see also that I bought this in a second-hand bookshop for three pounds I couldn't buy a pint of beer for three pounds now so this book Sweet Thames Run Softly, a quotation, of course, from Edmund Spencer, as he makes clear. Particularly, his Sweet Thames Run Softly Till I End My Song. Well, think of the momentous events that go on. You know, the Second World War is starting. Britain will soon be under, you know, enormous oppression of the Blitz. People, I mean, instead of, you know, I mean, obviously, I suppose one of the things that happens when suddenly everything, your whole country is under threat, your way of life, you know. Obviously people go out to war and they fight for it, but they also suddenly remember what it is they're wanting to defend. They think of that's everything that's peculiar and distinct and beautiful about their country. And that's perhaps part of what they love. Everybody could see in the summer of 39 that trouble was coming. And even by the summer of 40, they could probably see that pretty soon they weren't going to have the kind of leisure and there'd be blackouts everywhere. And Gibbings decided to do this trip down the Thames. He doesn't say at any point, maybe this is the last time I'll be able to do this for a while, but you, you've only got to look at the dates to realise that that's, that's the undercurrent, as it were. Um, but then I, I independently already liked this book. And then when I was discovering more about the Inklings, I mean, who I loved reading all my life, but discovering the Oxford Inklings, Lewis and Tolkien and Dyson and Co., um, how all, they all knew each other. I found a wonderful point of connection between this book, which I'm going to read you from shortly, and then, so here is a bit from 
I mean, Gibbings was an amazing man. He lived a very, you know, eccentric life, but rather adventurous and heroic. So, Lewis's walking tours with his brother and with Barfield came to an end with the outbreak of the war. Uh, Warney Lewis had acquired a small two-berth cabin cruiser, which he mauled at Salter's Boatyard on the Thames in Oxford, which he called Bosphorus. In August 39, he arranged to take Jack and Hugo Dyson on a short holiday up the river. Um, Jack being C.S. Lewis, of course. So then they, they acquire um, their friend, the Dr. Ira Havard, as well. Um, <coughs> they set off up the Thames from Oxford, following the river through low meadows and past riverside pubs. Few of these, remarked Havard, escaped a visit from us. That's exactly the way a boat trip on the Thames should be. On the first evening, after an hour or two spent at the Trout Inn at Godstow, Dyson and Lewis began a very vigorous argument about the Renaissance, which Lewis contended had never happened at all, or if it had, it hadn't mattered. They went on through the darkness to the Rose Revived at Newbridge. Lewis and Dyson slept in the inn while Havard spent the night on board. The next morning, Sunday, recalled Havard, we moved on to Tadpole Bridge and separated on foot to our respective churches in Buckland, a mile or so away. That afternoon, after lunch, we went on upstream and met, coming down, Robert Gibbings in a canoe, naked to the waist. His bearded figure was greeted rapturously, rapturously by Lewis with a quotation, Have sight of Proteus rising from the sea, or hear old Triton blow his wreathed horn. At this, Gibbings picked up an enormous conch from the bottom of his canoe and attempted to blow a fanfare on it. After some lively talk, each craft went on its way. Gibbings later put some of the canoe trip into his book, Sweet Thames, Run Softly. <laughs> I delight in the thought of these authors meeting by chance on the river. Anyway, let's give you a taste um, of uh, Gibbings. Um, I read you a bit um, last time, I think, about paddling so early in the morning that it's still grey and then gradually watching the colour come back into uh, but this is I'm going to read you now is a bit where he's he did this trip in several stages and one of them was uh, at spring rather than high summer and you may remember we read um Mole's Awakening and, and Wind in the Willows another Oxford and Thames author and the Mole's the description of spring so I thought you might like Gibbing's description of spring in the same part of the river probably Cuckoo, jug jug, pooey to it woo, spring, the sweet spring. Quotation of poetry. Now the celandines are sparkling in the marshes, and pools in the still flooded fields shine blue. The red shanks are whistling, the peewits are tumbling, the yellow wagtails trip along the muddy border of the stream, their breasts as brilliant as the king cups. The sand martins, too, whirling like leaves in a gale, advertise their return, while high up among the purple blossoms of the elm trees, the young rooks have already broken their shells. Nearer to earth, the poplars wave their catkins, and the willows and sallows regale the year's first broods of insect life. The sap is rising. Each day our world turns further towards the sun, all the energy held in bondage during the winter is being released. To quote an anonymous writer, week by week the crops swallow up the wildlife of the open countryside, while the woods and hedges draw veil after veil over the doings of the small things which they shelter. And wherever we go, a hundred eyes peep and a hundred ears listen of creatures that we cannot see or hear at all. If we should glimpse behind that veil, we must forget those fanatics who think that walking at less than four miles an hour is a sign of laziness or physical decay. Those are people who, after an excursion into the country, spend their evening at a cinema because they've seen nothing during the day with which to occupy their thoughts. We must learn to walk slowly so that we have time to see. We must learn to tread quietly so that we do not cause alarm. Above all, we must think peace. 
A certain visitor to the London Zoological Gardens was seen to be on terms of close friendship with the wolves. When asked how he dared to trust them, he replied, Perfect love casteth out fear. I believe that it is this gentleness of thought which brought about the understanding between so many of the medieval saints and the wild creatures amongst whom they lived. There was St. Columban, at whose call the squirrels and other animals of the woods would come and leap and frisk about him for sheer happiness, jumping up on him as young dogs jump on their masters. And St. Godric, who was visited regularly by a stag that he had sheltered from the huntsman, and St. Kieran, whose only companions were a fox, a badger, a wolf and a deer, all of them obeyed his words in all things, as if they had been his monks. The records are full of such stories of these mutual charities, as Miss Waddell has called them, and I am convinced that in many cases these stories are far more than mere legend. Now, the nice thing is, we'll have to save this up for another occasion, but the Miss Waddell he's quoting there is Helen Waddell, the great translator of medieval Latin lyrics, who put together a book, which I have somewhere, if I can find it, called Beasts and Saints, which has all these stories in it. And it is illustrated by, guess who, by Robert Gibbings. Uh, Gibbings is not a Christian. I mean, like he, you know, and he was quite suspicious of what he regarded as the sort of prurience of the church. He was all for sort of, uh, you know, the freedoms of the spring and youth. But um, nevertheless, he was deeply attracted to these stories of the medieval saints, and there it is. But uh, I love that thing about walking more slowly, seeing more, and above all, he says, think peace. And he's writing this on a brink of a war that he everybody knows is coming, and probably his last chance to get out and and see these things. Anyway, uh, nice to share it with you. You can pick one of these up, you know, I mean, I, obviously I just found this in a second-hand bookshop, but nowadays there's AB books and things, I should think. You know, he's he's very much under underrated and underappreciated, but he's one of the great masters of a great art. Anyway, thanks for dropping around.